please join me in giving Dr. Richard Deming a warm welcome. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I appreciate the, the warm welcome, and I'm embarrassed that it's been so long since I've been here to uh, Omaha and to Creighton, and so thank you for the warm welcome. Um, my presentation today is, uh, you know, when, when I heard it described as a lecture today, I thought, hmm, I don't usually describe this talk as a lecture, but uh, not in the traditional sense. Let's see if we can get this. Uh, and it's quite informal, so I notice it's kind of like church, everybody's in the back. Uh, so I might just have to walk down here. Um, I better get my clicker though. So what I'm going to talk about, the title of my talk is Above and Beyond, Cancer Survivors Trek to Everest, that's just sort of the title. Uh, the, the overall theme um, is more um, how my life has gone from a career in medicine to a ministry of healing. And uh, in the context of speaking at a medical school, that's the message that, that I want to come through. I'm going to tell you about the journey, but the journey is just a way of describing uh, the relationship I have with patients and what I have learned from my patients in a career in oncology and how it ends up being a dialogue and that we uh, who care for cancer patients learn as much about ourselves in a lifelong process. So let's begin the journey. So first Top, the first question that might come up is, you know, why would a cancer doctor take a bunch of cancer patients on a journey up into the mountains? And um, I think it's important to, to get a little bit of the background. So there's two pieces of the background. First of all, um, I had been doing some mountain climbing and uh, some adventure sports. And if you do mountain climbing anywhere, you want to go to the Himalayas. I mean, it's clearly the place where there's the highest mountains in the entire world. So in the year 2000, on no altruistic purpose at all, I signed up to go on a mountain climbing trip in the Himalayas. Um, how do you know if you're qualified to go mountain climbing in the Himalayas? Anybody know? Your credit card clears. If your credit card <laughs> clears, you are qualified to go anywhere and do anything. And um, I just signed up with a commercial climbing operation. I didn't know anybody on the trip. There were going to be five others from different places in the world. And I flew by myself to Kathmandu where I was going to hook up with the people I was going climbing with. And this was going to be fulfilling a dream of mine. This was going to be about going further, farther, faster, higher, and getting to the tops of peaks and, and, and you know, leaving everyone in my wake if I had to. Um, so that's how this story began, and I did have an incredible journey of climbing this mountain. Um, and as I'm over there in this atmosphere, I started to learn things about myself that I had no idea I was going there to learn. And as we started this journey up the mountain in 2000, we were in the rice paddies at 1,000 feet, and we ended up going up to 22,000 feet. And I've got this big old backpack with everything I could possibly want. And I've got extra hat and extra gloves and extra coat. And you're journeying up through these villages where they have no hats or coats or gloves. And you quickly realize as you're going from 1,000 feet to 22,000 feet with a big old backpack that not only is the stuff that you're carrying unnecessary, but literally a burden. So you start giving away stuff that you do not need. And it becomes so liberating to lighten your backpack and give away stuff. And as you're journeying for three weeks in the mountains, and back in 2000, we had no way of communicating back home. So back then, there was no satellite uh, phones and no cell phones. And, and you realize as you're relying on your team and you're going through villages and you, you're living a simple life that, that you've also brought with you to Nepal a lot of stuff that is not only unnecessary but a burden. And over the course of that time, 
you allow that to go away as well. And you realize that, that climbing a mountain becomes a process that's as much philosophical as physical, and, and if you allow it to be also as, as spiritual as it is physical. And I had a wonderful experience, and it was really fulfilling a dream, but I knew that if I had the opportunity to someday take others that I cared about on a journey into the mountains of Nepal, that it would be a great thing to do. It would not have been April 2011 if it weren't for this guy. So this guy's name, if you're in Iowa, you'd know who this was. This is Charlie Whitmack. Charlie's the first Iowan to have summited Mount Everest. Now, Charlie is a real mountain climber, um, and he's a lawyer. And after he climbed, he's, um, he's 34 years old now, so he was in his late 20s when he first accomplished uh, his first summit. And uh, so through a senior partner at his firm, who's about my age, we, we connected because he knew I had climbed. And so after he got back from, from climbing Everest, uh, we, we got together and he, we talked about our experiences. And uh, mostly I listened about his experiences. And uh, he, over the course of the last few years, knew of my activities as uh, being a, a strong proponent of vigorous physical activity as part of the cancer treatment and especially part of the cancer survivorship. And I have a group of about 600 cancer survivors that I oversee cancer survivor program. I teach spin class for them. I'm engaged in physical, uh, vigorous physical activity with them. So a couple years ago, he had a life-changing experience. His wife was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, she's doing fine. It ended up being a favorable prognosis cancer, but as many of you know, when you or a family member is diagnosed with cancer, it is like a two-by-four up the side of your head that wakes you up and tells you what you already know is that you're going to die someday, but reminds you that perhaps your death is going to be sooner than you expected. And if you have dreams, today's a good day to start to accomplish those dreams. And so both Charlie and Kate had dreams. Kate dreamt of being a novelist, and her cancer journey propelled her to do that. And Charlie had this dream ever since he was age 13 to do what he called the World Triathlon. So the World Triathlon was this event he made up where he would start where the Thames River starts in England, swim all the way down the Thames River, hang a left, swim across the English Channel, get out of the water in France, jump on a bicycle, ride his bike across. Europe and Asia to Kathmandu, Nepal, get off his bike, run to Everest Base Camp, and then climb Mount Everest again. So that's the World Triathlon. And he wanted to do it not just to prove that he's the studliest Iowan there is, but, but to bring others along with him, physically and metaphorically, and to, to encourage people to dream big and to actualize their dreams. So, he had come up with this, and he called me in early 2010 and said, Dr. Deming, I just want to tell you about this thing I'm doing. And, and so we got together for a couple beers at a bar, and he told me about the World Triathlon. And neither of us today can remember whose idea it was, but out of that session came the idea that I would take a group of cancer survivors and trek to base camp where he would be having already done those other things and he would host us at base camp and then he would go on to summit Mount Everest and we would come back. And so we said, yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. I committed to doing it and then I did nothing about it. I, I just, um, one, of my, one of my docs in my practice died suddenly at age 43. Charlie got hit by a car in Kazakhstan, and he got altitudes, and I'm thinking, oh boy, I'm glad I didn't plan this thing, because it doesn't look like it's going to happen. And then in December of 2010, he came back to Des Moines to recuperate a little bit before going back to complete it. He said, you know what, I'm feeling strong, We're gonna, I'm going to do it, let's, let's, are you in? And I said, yeah, this sounds just, this is good, let's, I'll do it. And then I didn't do anything. And then it was December 2010, mid-December, and I was at a gala 
uh, event and uh, a, a reporter from the Des Moines Register came up, so here's the power of journalism, came up to me at the event and said, Dr. Demling, I heard you're going to take a group of cancer survivors to meet up with Charlie Whitnack at Everest Base Camp. Is that true? And I said, yes. And it was in the paper the next day, and I was committed, and both feet were in, and it became easy. Once you commit to something, it becomes easy. So the next thing was I had to quickly assemble a group of cancer survivors to take to Mount Everest Base Camp. So how do you do that? Well, the first thing I knew is that it would be a, a, a bigger, deeper, better, richer experience for everyone if it were not limited to cancer survivors who could afford to go. So this was just going to be a one-time thing, so I, I, I didn't have time to, to try to go out and solicit funds, so I just committed my own funds so that no cancer survivor would have to pay to go on this trip. And I knew that I would go out and, and seek some other funding, but if, I didn't, if it didn't happen, fine. And as it turns out, 10 of the 14 cancer survivors had never been out of the country had never had passports, never would have been able to do a trip like this. And as it also turns out, when you're passionate about something and, and articulate your passion, others will come forward. And, and as it turns out, I wasn't the only one paying for this. There were others, including patients of mine and family members of deceased patients and, and, and healthcare organizations that wanted to also participate. So, we started to assemble a group of cancer survivors for the journey. Let me introduce you. This is not my story. This is their story. Uh, Justin was 27 years old, had had um, a grade 3 astrocytoma, size of a racquetball, removed from his right temporal brain about eight months prior to this had gone through six weeks of uh, radiation therapy and chemotherapy, was a, rock, was a lead singer in a rock band. So with uh, Justin on board, we brought along a guitar, two tambourines, and a cowbell. And we had the rockinest band in all of the kumbu. Teresa, Teresa works as a radiation therapist. She gives radiation treatments to cancer patients. Six months prior to this, she was diagnosed with breast cancer in both breasts, had both of her breasts removed, had chemotherapy, reconstruction, and she was uh, three months out from treatment when she signed up to do this trip. Oh, and by the way, eight years ago, she had a total hip replacement. And 10 years ago, she had her colon removed for Crohn's disease. Bobby, Bobby's the only patient that I've diagnosed in the YMCA locker room. So Bobby came up to me in the locker room, he's a triathlete buddy of mine, and said, hey doc, feel this. A big old lymph node in his neck, turned out he had stage four tonsil cancer. We darn near killed him with chemotherapy and radiation therapy. He was a year out from treatment when he signed up for this journey. Uh, Amelia was diagnosed with breast cancer at age 24, bilateral mastectomies, radiation therapy, chemotherapy. Lynette was 32 years old when she was breastfeeding her son, who was two months old and noted a mass in her breast, had surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and was cancer-free for two years, developed recurrence, more surgery, more chemo, more radiation, was cancer-free for three years, developed recurrence more surgery, more radiation, more chemo. She was one month out from chemo when she signed on to this journey. She brought her husband Chad along. They left son Parker back home with grandpas and grandma. Um, Lynette's about 92 pounds and Chad's about 260. Chad was the first one to get sick on the trip. Bad <laughs> diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. And she was taking care of him and, and I got the this the most touching note, it was, she said it was the first time in eight years that she had had the opportunity to take care of him. Uh, Karen, a breast cancer survivor, she was about eight years out from her treatment. Kathy, Kathy has neurofibromatosis, she's 52, she's had about 30 surgeries in her lifetime, mostly removal of benign neurofibromas but had a sarcoma on her arm, that, that removed, it recurred, more surgery, radiation, 
her left arm doesn't work quite right. We sort of have to tape the hand to the pole. And she's deathly afraid of heights. And she's not an athlete. And she's got an artificial knee. She fell down more times on this journey. I mean, literally, dozens, just, and she'd get up and, and um, when she made it, she made it all the way to base camp. And I, I swear to God, when you see the video, five feet before the tent where Charlie's waiting for us, she takes a face plant and, and it's just like almost on cue. And she gets up and Ch Charlie, he had not met the cancer survivors, but he was already well off on his journey before we went. And when he saw, and the mountain climbers, the real mountain climbers saw what ragtag group that I brought, I mean, it was, it was quite inspirational to them. Uh, Gail is, uh, was the old man of this trip. He was 65. He would be a youngster for the group that ended up going to Kilimanjaro. He had prostate cancer, had his prostate removed. It recurred. He had radiation. He was a couple years out from treatment when he signed up on this journey. Um, Lynn Vestal is a mental health counselor, breast cancer survivor, surgery, chemo, radiation. Um, and uh, she, uh, her clientele is cancer survivors and um, young women with eating disorders. Brandon spent six months at Mayo Clinic Bone Marrow Transplant Unit for treatment of acute myelogenous leukemia as an adult and was uh, two years out from his uh, donor transplant when he signed up on the journey. Peggy Scott's a physical therapist uh, by day and a breast cancer survivor by night. Maybe not, that not, might not be the right way to phrase it, and uh, signed up on the journey. Trace, Trace is a police officer in Des Moines, member of the SWAT team. He took me on a SWAT mission three days before we went to Nepal. That's a story in and of itself. Um, Trace, stage four Hodgkin's disease, chemotherapy, was cancer-free for two years, recurrence. More chemotherapy, stem cell transplant, cancer-free for two years, recurrence. More chemotherapy, radiation therapy, he was nine months cancer-free when he came on this journey, leaving his wife and child back home. Stacy, breast cancer survivor, also a rocky road of recurrences before ultimately being three years cancer-free when signing up on this journey. Uh, Linda Hoskins was the oldest woman on this journey, 56 years old, principal of Albia High School, Hodgkin's disease survivor. She did a, um, an assembly for her high school from Everest Base Camp via cell phone and the PA system in their school. Uh, the, the commonality of this group is they're, they're, with the exception of Bobby, who is 51 and, and does triathlons, not athletes, not mountain climbers, not people who have always wanted to go to Mount Everest and, and just happen to have cancer. They're on the journey not in spite of their cancer, they're on the journey because of their cancer, because of the confidence and courage they gained through their cancer journey that they were willing to sign up for something they didn't know if they could do, but they knew that, that trying to do this, that reaching for something that's, that's beyond the grasp of what you know you can attain will provide tremendous growth. They weren't certain they could climb the mountain, but they were certain that trying to climb the mountain would be rewarding. Um, so we got together. Uh, we have a, a, a beautiful he healthy living center by my cancer center where we do our, our cancer survivor program and they donated space for us to work out and we would work out during the week and we would go hiking in, in Des Moines, uh, climb the mountains of Des Moines to get ready for this. Actually, I live in a 25-story um, building so we did a lot of time in the stairwells. But in addition to the physical training, once a week at the Cancer Survivor Program, we have a, a talk on, on something. Well, for the two months before we went to Nepal, I sort of co-opted the Cancer Survivor Weekly talk for things that I thought would be of interest to us. So we talked about the, the philosophy of existentialism and, and adversity leading to personal growth. I brought in um, experts on Hinduism and Buddhism, on the Nepali culture, on mountains. So we were going to go to Nepal prepared to learn whatever the mountain and the people had to teach us, not just 
run over there and climb up a mountain and plant a flag, but to really have a transformative experience. So we flew from Des Moines to Chicago, Chicago nonstop to Abu Dhabi, Abu Dhabi to Kathmandu, um, two wonderfully exotic words, Abu Dhabi and Kathmandu. Um, and we got together then in Kathmandu for a couple of days, kind of get over the jet lag. I mean, it is literally halfway around the world. And spent some time visiting the, the Hindu uh, and Buddhist world heritage sites and just had a wonderful, who's been to Kathmandu here? Nobody. There we go. And uh, it's a beautiful place, isn't it? And uh, uh, just uh, enjoyed the sights and sounds and smells and, and uh, kind of continued to bond as a, as a team. Then we flew up into the mountains. So when you fly into Kathmandu, you land at the international airport. And when you fly internally, you use a little airport. So we got a, on these little airplanes and in, uh, we had to have two planes. So we're 14 cancer survivors and 15 caregivers. And so let me explain for it became apparent today talking to somebody that the term cancer survivor doesn't always mean the same to everyone. In, in the 1950s, if you said so-and-so is a cancer survivor, it meant their spouse died of cancer. That's what a cancer survivor was in the 50s because people didn't survive cancer, so a cancer survivor was someone who, who, who was the spouse of someone who had died of cancer. Now, cancer survivor does not mean you are cured of cancer. Cancer survivor means you're alive and you've been diagnosed with cancer. So you're a cancer survivor from day one. Um, so our group consisted of 14 cancer survivors. Um, and as I've already described, many of them have been cured several times. And it obviously begs the question, do you ever really know if you're cured? And are you ever really cured? And, and uh, how do you get philosophically a handle about that? And the other 15 we call caregivers. So you're either a survivor or a caregiver in the world of journeying with above and beyond cancer. So we get on the planes and we fly to Lukla, L-U-K-L-A. So if you Google Lukla, what will come up is world's most dangerous airport. And so <laughs> and there, you can see videos and the Lukla runway is about the size. You already know I'm a, I was a Navy doc. If you've ever seen an aircraft carrier, that's a runway, and that then the runway at Lukla is about the same length as that. But have you ever seen a video of somebody landing on an aircraft carrier? You know, they got the hook and the cable, and they hit the hook, and, and if they don't hit the hook, they just continue going, and they take off, and they, and they get a do-over. Well, there's no do-overs in Lukla because the runway ends in a mountain. And if you don't stick the landing, you, you just run into the mountain. And then when you do take off, the plane just turns around. And the runway's not long enough to get lift, but it ends at a cliff. And so you just kind of go off the cliff. And then you've got enough space to get some lift before you get back up again. So that is, that's, the, that's Lukla. And you land in Lukla, and you are literally have the world's highest mountains around you. And I, don't, I was not prepared for the emotional impact getting out of the plane. The plane takes off and we're standing there, you know, with the world's highest mountains. We're getting ready to start our walk nine days up to 18,000 feet. And we had traveled halfway around the world and we arrived in Lukla on exactly the day we said we were going to arrive and we're all there. and. Um, you know, certainly we're starting to feel little effects of altitude and the beauty of the mountains. But the emotion that hit me that day and then hit me a thousand more times in the next two weeks was I remembered back to ten years ago when I was there in Lukla. And I remembered how good I felt then and, and how that trip ten years ago was fulfilling a dream of mine. And then I, I looked around and I realized I was embarking on a journey it wasn't going to be fulfilling a dream. It was going to be giving birth to dreams. And the difference between a personal fulfillment of a dream and the opportunity to give birth to dreams is just incredible. I knew that this was going to be difficult physically. I mean, if it wasn't going to be difficult, we, we wouldn't be there. 
Um, it's a adversity leading to personal growth. But I also knew that it was going to be difficult for people, totally discombobulated time zone, and, and, and they're, they're not hikers, they're not, they've never been camping, they just, that establishing a rhythm to the day would be an important thing. So the rhythm that I, I established from the very beginning would be first thing in the morning at 6 o'clock, the Sherpas would awaken us with a rustle of the tent door or a knock on the lodge, depending on where we were staying that night, and a cup of tea and a namaste, a, a, a greeting that acknowledges the divine within each of us. And then at 7 o'clock each morning, we would sit down together for breakfast, and before breaking bread, one of the cancer survivors would give a blessing, a thanksgiving, uh, thanking everyone and everything thing that had made it possible for us to be there. Thanking the porters and the Sherpas for preparing the food that we were going to eat. Thanking those back home that were doing our jobs for us back home so that we could be there. And praying that we would have the strength to get through the day and the wisdom to learn what the mountain was going to teach us that day. We would then go outside and I took along with us our um, yoga instructor who for the past two years had been donating her time once a week to teach yoga for the, for the group of survivors. And we would assemble in the courtyard and beneath the mountains and uh, do yoga. And then each morning I would share a reflection with the group to kind of again put us into a frame of mind of accepting what was going to come. And I want to share with you the reflection that I shared with them the, the very first day. There's a book I would recommend to everyone. It's by uh, John O'Donohue. This, this particular version has been to the top of several mountains. Um, and it's called To Bless the Space Between Us. And John O'Donohue was a Catholic priest. He's from Ireland. And his, he, he left the priesthood. And his... Um, Spirituality is, is kind of very open and almost new age with a Celtic twist to it. And this book is filled with blessings that read like a combination of, of poetry and prayer. And each day I would share one to kind of start the day as a reflection. And the one that I shared as right before we started hiking the very first day was called For a New Beginning. In out-of-the-way places of the heart where your thoughts never think to wander, this beginning has been quietly forming, waiting until you were ready to emerge. For a long time, it's watched your desire, feeling the emptiness growing inside you, noticing how you willed yourself on, still unable to leave what you had outgrown. It watched you play with the seduction of safety and the gray promises that sameness whispered, heard the waves of turmoil rise and relent, and wondered, would you always live like this? Then the delight, when your courage kindled and out you stepped onto new ground, your eyes young again with energy and dream, a path of plenitude opening before you. Though your destination is not yet clear, you can trust the promise of this opening. Unfurl yourself into the grace of beginning that is at one with your life's desire. Awaken your spirit to adventure. Hold nothing back. Learn to find ease in risk. Soon you will be home in a new rhythm, for your soul senses the world that awaits you. And we began the journey up the mountain, nine days up. And uh, so we're just going to journey through Nepal here. And um, you're, you're on a pathway through the Khumbu that everybody's on the same pathway, whether you're a serious mountain climber going to the top of Mount Everest or you're a trekker or you're just a villager going to the next village to buy rice or go to school. You are just, uh, for us, nine days of journeying up day by day, foot by foot, um, each, each day is uh, filled with just excitement and, and 
laughter and joy and beauty and ecstasy and diarrhea and vomiting and <laughs> headaches and, and, and bliss and blisters. And that's just the first half hour. Um, and as you journey, it's in many ways becomes a walking meditation and um, opportunity for communication and communion um, along the way. If you're afraid of heights, there's a few challenges that uh, face you on your journey up. I think there's about 14 bridges. Um, and there's lots of opportunity to help one another along the way. You don't make it up the mountain on your own. And uh, opportunity for uh, lots of sights and sounds and smells that you don't see anywhere else. Uh, lots of opportunity for laughter. Lots of opportunity for, for hugging and helping. Uh, just in helping Kathy up the mountain. Um, lots of hugs. And you, when somebody says, how do, you, how do you do it? How do you get them up there? And the answer is mostly hugs. Uh, you know, somebody is down and you just kind of write a prescription, 29 hugs. Well, no, 28, 28 hugs. Um, so mostly hugs, a few kicks in the butt, can or two a suck it up. Uh, sprinkled liberally with antibiotics and anti-altitude medicine. Um, and one of the things about being in a foreign land in the mountains on a long journey is the opportunity to see things that are very different from the way we th see things, do things differently. And if you're the least bit introspective and you are, are every day viewing things being done differently and, and observing practices and philosophies different, if you're the least bit introspective, you open yourself up to the possibility that maybe the way we do everything, you know, isn't necessarily, certainly isn't the only way and maybe isn't even the best way and opens yourself up to the possibility that we can learn something from others along the way. Uh, Justin uh, was definitely the hit. Um, he has guitar playing and singing, and uh, although we had a pretty wicked cowbell player too. Um, and Kathy, Kathy was just, she, um, I was a little concerned about Kathy. I physically, I knew, I didn't expect everybody was going to make it to the top. So uh, physically not making it to the top was not something that I worried a lot about unless I thought the person was just going to be devastated. But Kathy um, grew up with a fairly simple uh, beginning and a kind of uh, fundamental, uh, th she doesn't always look more than a foot beyond her. And I, I knew that it was going to be tough and I wasn't sure that um, this idea of adversity leading to personal growth was something that she uh, truly philosophically understood. And um, it was going to be tough. And it was tough. And she required a lot of assistance. You can see her left arm doesn't work right. She's got an artificial knee that swells up. And she is afraid of heights. She doesn't see very well and her footing isn't good. So it was a perfect person to take on this trip. And she uh, needed help getting across the bridges and uh, step by step across the rocks. And um, I love this photograph. So this is, this is Kathy. Um, you know, the, the, the slope is over here, so she's as far over here as she can be. Teresa uh, of, of no breast and artificial hip and no colon, um, Teresa was, was almost as slow as Kathy, but Kathy was slower. And Teresa early on found great strength and comfort in helping Kathy. Kathy was the only person on the trip that Teresa could help. And she found just great strength in walking with Kathy and helping Kathy under the watchful eye of the Sherpa. This is um, Lynn 
and uh, Anglakpa. Anglakpa was the only female Sherpa. So Sherpa means, you know, at least three different things. Sherpa is the, the name of the tribe of folks that live up in the mountains, kind of right there between Nepal and Tibet. They're Buddhist, and, and that's the sort of the tribe. It also, since we as Westerners think everybody has to have two names, it's their last name. So everybody's last name now is Sherpa. And their first name is the day of the, tr traditionally is the day of the week they were born, so there's lots of Sherpas with the same names. Ang Lakpa Sherpa, um, her name is Lakpa Sherpa, and her husband's name is Lakpa Sherpa. And um, because she's particularly beautiful, she, there's a diminutive, and I might not have this quite right, but the A-N-G. At first I thought that was like Mrs. Lakpa Sherpa, because her husband's Lakpa Sherpa, she's Ang Lakpa Sherpa, but it wasn't until later I found out that Ang Lakpa just kind of means beautiful Lakpa. And um, she didn't speak much English. The Sherpas are the ones that interact with us Westerners and speak English and guide and, and help with logistics. And then there's a whole group of porters that's job is to just carry the gear. And they typically don't speak a lot of English, but the Sherpas do. Ang Lakpa, I'm sure, was on our trip because of her husband. And they live in that area. Beautiful, beautiful, kind, caring woman. She, she knew about two words of English and it was okay, okay which is maybe just one word, but, and, and, then, and then she would say, 10 minutes. So, you know, your question to how long is it to uh, wherever is 10 minutes. <laughs> but just the kindest person. Well, Lynn, like everybody, was sick, but Lynn was like toast sick. And she was like two days from base camp, and she had perhaps pneumonia, certainly bronchitis, definitely altitude sickness and she couldn't go forward. So the treatment for altitude sickness, the, the best treatment is to go down. You can throw whatever drugs you want, but the best treatment is to go down. So we sent her down with Ang Lakpa, and Ang Lakpa took her down a village to her own village, took her into her home, and restored her to health. And actually while she was, well, we went up, and before we hooked up with them again on the way back down, she uh, uh, took her, uh, Lynn to some small intimate Buddhist ceremonies, to some family dinners, and they really had a wonderful time, which was salve on the wound of not making it to the top. So the last day of the nine days up, we go to base camp, and the trail then becomes, you, so you leave the last village, and you're going up to base camp, and the trail becomes more difficult. Still, it's, it's walking, it's not climbing, it's walking, um, but the footing becomes less sure, and it got colder, and, and, the, and it was snowing, and we get to base camp, and as I told you, Kathy just like almost on cue, <laughs> falls over just feet from, from the tent, and, and Charlie and the other mountain climbers, and, and believe it, Charlie was there. So one of the things I didn't tell you is when we planned all this, Charlie said, so this, you know, this is how it was going to work out, but do not tell anybody they're going to see me because I'm going to be climbing Mount Everest. And it all depends on the weather. You might get to base camp and I might be halfway up the mountain. So don't tell anybody they're going to see me. Don't tell anybody they're going to actually see Mount Everest because it could be socked in the whole time you're there. And as it turns out, it was beautiful. The weather was beautiful. Charlie was right there at base camp waiting for us as we arrived. And um, he and his other climbers, it was the first time they were meeting our group. And they were just like, I think they thought we were going to be like an adventure travel group of active hikers. And we come wandering in, you know, clearly having had our goal of adversity leading to personal growth. And um, one of the things we did then the next, so that night, we, we stayed at the base camp, and most people go to base camp, just go up there for a day, uh, visit, and then go back down. And you're, you don't really, you're not supposed to camp at base camp unless you have a permit to climb Mount Everest. That's right where the Kumbu ice fields begins. But because of Charlie and the association we had with his climbing group, we were allowed to camp there overnight. Um, we got down about 20 below that night. All the water bottles froze, but the skies cleared. We woke up the next day, and it was just gorgeous. And there are prayer flags all over Nepal. So a traditional prayer flag in Nepal is inscribed with uh, in Nepali or Tibetan prayers. And the idea is that the, the flags fly 
from auspicious places and the wind uh, catches the flags and carries the prayers off the flags and around the world. Well, we had carried with us about 300 prayer flags from Iowa that we brought up with us. And our prayer flags were different. So our prayer flags project started um, the morning that it was in the paper that I was going to take a group of cancer survivors to Everest Base Camp. That, that very morning, um, Chris's dad called me. So Chris, um, I had the uh, honor and horror of being one of Chris's doctors. And Chris had been um, gone for about not quite a year when his dad called me. And he said, oh, Chris would be all over this. And I said, I know. And Chris is going with me. And we talked, and it became clear how important it was to his parents that you know, Chris was with me. And um, so we, I knew it would be nice to have an actual physical manifestation. So having been there before, I knew of the prayer flags. And, and we came up with the idea of creating prayer flags for family members to create prayer flags that would go with us to the mountain that would fly at Everest Base Camp. And, and this is the prayer flag that that um, Chris's family made for Chris. Chris is forever 22. He had a chordoma that started in his sacrum and eventually spread. And by the time he died, he was nearly quadriplegic. He had been through many, 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 many treatments. He, in life, was just the most gregarious. He was involved in, in politics. And, and um, he was the uh, president of the Explorers Club. And he was into drama and opera and sports and everything and everyone loved Chris and he was so the last time I saw Chris alive um, he had had me come out to the house um, I had done my first Ironman triathlon and when, during the two years that I got to know Chris we just talked about everything and it was he said oh come out and tell me about it at that point he, he really couldn't leave home and the irony that I in my late 50s was going to go talk to a 22 year old who's in a wheelchair about this iron man was um, you know more than ironic but one of the things about chris is he really really was passionate about anything you were passionate about and he just took great joy and the fact that i got through the triathlon the iron man thinking of chris often you know the iron man is is is, is a man made adversity that you put in front of yourself that you could easily go around. Well, his adversity was, was certainly not some optional adversity. And uh, so whenever going gets tough during a, um, a long race, you think about the fact that it's optional and that there are people who don't have options. So Chris was the, the real inspiration behind the prayer flags. So that morning, we got out and we took all of the prayer flags out of our backpack and put them all up with the help of Charlie and, and the other climbers. And we then did a Relay for Life on base camp. So Relay for Life is an American Cancer Society event where you celebrate survivorship, remember those that have gone before, and, and vow to fight back. So we got all of the flags up. And the first lap, we had 13 cancer survivors that had made it to 18,000 feet, Everest Base Camp. And the first is a joyful celebration of survivorship. And then the second lap, everybody joins in, the caregiver lap, to uh, acknowledge the caregivers. And all the Sherpas and the porters joined us in that lap. And then the third lap is remember. And remember those that have lost their life to cancer. And um, Chris's flag is flying. And my mom, who had uh, died of uh, lung cancer when I was a second year medical student, and many, many patients of mine. And uh, that lap is a silent lap in memory with the flags flying beneath the, um, the sky. And I want to share with you um, what Chris's dad had written on his flag. Chris wrote, uh, uh, Chris's dad, Joel, wrote, my dearest Chris, I remember your childhood so vividly as you delved into the world with curiosity and gusto. 
You were interested in everything, weren't content to know just a little, and asked a million probing questions each day. As you grew, your curiosity tur turned inward to yourself and outward to those around you. You pushed yourself and those you touched to learn new things, master new talents, and to live with passion, not with an external reward in mind, but rather for the pure love of knowledge and self-fulfillment. As you grew to a young man, I marveled at your intelligence and talent, was inspired by your humor and kindness, and was in awe of your humor and charm. You were in command of your world and shared it with those around you. Even after your illness stole your strength, your heart remained full of life, compassion, and joy. By what grace I had a son like you, I can never know. But for it, I will be eternally grateful. My prayer for you is that your soul continues to soar as it did in life. For myself, I pray that someday I may be half the man that you were. With endless love and admiration, Dad. And um, that day, Chris soared in the uh, Nepal breeze, along with about 299 others, as we then made our final lap around our relay for life, and that's fight back. And that's, that's saying those that have died will not have died in vain, and that their life and their death will inspire, in fact, demand of us that we do what we can do to help reduce the burden of cancer, to help find a cure, to help advocate for more research dollars, to advocate for better health care policy, to give everyone access, to, to talk about prevention. And we ended our Relay for Life. We had a visitor that joined in. He's down there. That's Hero. So Hero's a stray dog that wanders up and down the Kumbu. And he happened to be up at Everest Base Camp with us. There's no dog food at Everest Base Camp, but he has no problem uh, getting by, like all of us, with a little help from some friends. And the day that morning, when that morning started, he and Kathy just struck it off. I mean, I think he kind of knew that Kathy was having troubles, and they were just like best buddies. On, and he did the whole Relay for Life with us and um, kind of was a big boost to us. So we assembled for our last photograph at Everest Base Camp and then packed up our flags and headed down the mountain. One of the other uh, of life's lessons is to share with ever others things that you enjoy and things that are meaningful. And um, I was so glad that, that, I had the, that we had the foresight to take along with us a writer. So he's a freelance writer, had been out of school for a, f a, f for a while, and uh, he did our blogging, but he also wrote about uh, the journey and about the survivors. And I just want to share with you just a, a brief um, entry that he put. Because when we came back, we were just blown away by the people that had been following us and how people, uh, other survivors, just felt like they were on the journey with us. And how, you know, this would have been incredibly rewarding, rewarding and life transforming for those of us on the journey if nobody else had even known about it. But to share uh, this sort of an adventure and let others. Uh, come along. And this is what uh, Brian, um, our journalist, wrote in, in the blog entry um, the day after the uh, Everest Base Camp. He wrote, We silently circled the flags as an American Cancer Society tradition known as Relay for Life. The lap symbolized survivors, caregivers, lives lost to cancer, and finally fighting back. It marked the highest Relay for Life ever carried out. The hugs exchanged and the weeping that ensued is something that I never want to fully understand, but I'm glad I witnessed. I knew then, better than ever, what a powerful effect this thing called cancer had on these individuals. The survivors and their supporters then packed their bags and headed down the largest hill they'd ever climbed. It will take them four days to reach the bottom before boarding a plane for home. 
The first night down the mountain, we gathered in a frigid lodge, ate warm soup, drank warm tea, and reflected back on what we'd just accomplished. Some did this through hilarious narrative, some through poetic words, others quietly to themselves. Later that night, I looked down the sleepy hallway of our lodge, noticing my clouds of breath that hung in the cold air. Then I saw something outside one of the rooms. As I approached it, the power of the scene hit me like the completion of a magic trick. It was a sleeping dog, the same black and white one that had danced among us miles back at base camp the day before. He was lying outside Kathy's door in a hallway filled of heroes. So if you were in Des Moines, you'd recognize this as the escalator coming down from the gates to the airport lobby. And before coming down, um, we assembled up at the top and, and you know, it just kind of had another reflection together and I said, you know, everyone will figure out what this trip meant to them. Um, and it may take a while, but I just want to share with you my feelings right now as, as we get ready to begin life again. And that is that no matter why we were on this journey, whether we were there because we were a cancer survivor or a cancer doctor or a caregiver, <coughs> that none of us should feel that this was a journey that we earned or deserved, but that it was truly a blessing of cosmic proportions and that as we <coughs> re-immerse ourselves in life, that, that when, when we come across others in need, we should search for the Sherpa within each of us to, to extend out a hand of generosity and compassion and that we need to engage as part of our life work a commitment to help reduce the burden of cancer. And you know, we're still sometimes back in Nepal. And a couple of epilogues. So about six weeks after we're back, my, my phone goes off and I look down at lots and lots and lots of phone numbers and I realize this is an international call and I answer the phone and it is Lakpa, Ang Lakpa's husband. And he goes, Dr. Dick, Dr. Dick, Ang Lakpa has leukemia. And all I can think to say is, Lakpa, we can help you. I had no idea whether she had leukemia, what type of leukemia, how they'd found this out. And I'm sure, I mean, 95% of people in Nepal, if you get cancer, you just die. You don't find out you have cancer. So she did, over the next few days, learn that she did have leukemia with CML, incurable but controllable with an oral medication that costs $40,000 a year in a country where the average income is 250. So our group, Above and Beyond Cancer, I was able to talk to the drug manufacturer and they're going to provide the medication for life. She has to once a month get a blood test and get her medication. It takes two weeks for her to walk from her village to the hospital. So our group is once a month providing round trip air transportation from the world's most dangerous airport to Kathmandu and back. And you think, wh what was this trip all about? I mean, here's, she had nursed our folks back to health and here we were being able to help her in the whole karma of the world. And then six weeks later, Kathy recurs, has a new um, sarcoma on her leg, has undergone surgery, has the million more friends and supporters on her team. And just two months ago, Lynette, who had left her eight-year-old back home, developed her fourth recurrence of cancer and now is stage four breast cancer incurable and still journeying through life with the knowledge that, um, you know, there's more twists and turns along the way. And then we tell the story and, and where are you going to go next? And you know, what ended up as a once in a lifetime has now morphed into above and beyond cancer. And in January, I took 19 cancer survivors to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, 11 women 
and, and eight men, including a 73-year-old, a 72-year-old Catholic priest who delayed his cancer treatment to climb to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, saying mass along the way in these interfaith ceremonies with, with Catholics, Protestants, Jews, and Muslims, giving us all sacrament of the sick. A 69-year-old guy with active incurable cancer, two artificial knees, and an artificial hip. And he got his sorry butt to the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro, 19,341 feet. A 42-year-old woman with CML on oral chemotherapy made it to the top. You have no idea what you can accomplish in life. You have no idea. And unless you're willing to reach for something beyond your grasp, you never will know. Um, so as you continue your studies, um, I started medical school in 1976. You know, just be willing to reach for something beyond your grasp. And you'll have that opportunity every day. Thank you for inviting me to come. I appreciate it. Um, I probably took up all the time. I'd be happy to answer questions afterwards. I'm, I'm sure you guys have one o'clock obligations. Yes? Yes, and it's, it's interesting you should mention that's called RAM, the Race Across America, and I don't know if it's, I'm taking a group of seven cancer survivors and myself, we're going to compete in that race. We leave June 16th from San Diego. We will ride 3,000 miles in seven days and end up in Annapolis, Maryland. Dr. Breedlove it did it as a solo, so that race can be done as a solo ride. You don't do it in seven days if you do it solo, but you ride day and night. There's rules if you do it solo to try to keep you from falling asleep. We will do it as the eight-person team. One person's riding all the time, continuous, but we've got seven cancer survivors that are not bicycle racers. We, we'll get last place in our division because it's not a cancer race, but we want to go fast enough we don't get disqualified. So that's the race across America. And then in October, I'm taking a group to Mount Kailash, which is the world's most sacred mountain. And it's in Tibet. It's the home of uh, Lord Shiva. And it's also sacred in several other religions. Along with cancer survivors, I'm going to take along a holy person from the Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Jewish, and Islamic tradition. So in addition to being a physical adversity leading to personal growth as we go up to 18,000 feet and around the mountain. It will also be an interfaith dialogue on what the religions have to say about compassion and suffering in the human condition through the, through the eyes of a cancer survivor.